Arrowhead of the National Park Service, Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. Malba Patillo Beals, 2005 interview produced by Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site. Interview conducted by Joanna Miller Lewis. My name is Johanna Miller Lewis. I'm professor of history at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And today is August 29th, 2005. I'm here interviewing Melba Patillo Beals, a member of the Little Rock Nine for the Central High Oral History Project. So if we could begin with when and where you were born. Okay, I'm gonna take the Missouri Pacific Hospital, Little Rock, Arkansas. I guess it would be North Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. North Little Rock, Arkansas, Missouri Pacific Hospital. Tell me a little bit about the neighborhood um, where you grew up in Little Rock. 1121 Cross Street is was at the time, I guess you would call for that time a black middle and lower class neighborhood, uh, a working neighborhood. Uh, we had a little, little house there, uh, a little white house. I just actually went to see it yesterday. And uh, very, very warm. My mother was a teacher. My grandmother was a maid in White Lady's Kitchens for a dollar a day. But um, my mother and grandmother were intellectuals. My grandmother read Shakespeare all the time. She considered reading important. She read to us and we would sit at the dining room table and we would discuss reading and discuss what was going on. My mother was actually one of the people who integrated the University of Arkansas. She worked on her master's degree here and so she would come in with her books. She was both teaching and a student. And so a great part of our life, like one important part of my life was at the beginning of the year in September, folding, creasing the books for her and looking at the books. And so my whole life was vested in education, first religion, second education. Um, in talking about education, um, where did you go to school uh, prior to um, Central? Gibbs Elementary, Dunbar Junior High, Horace Mann High. Um, Dunbar, of course, was the high school for African Americans um, right before Horace Mann and um, Central desegregated. Um, well, it was first a junior high, Dunbar was. Dunbar was kind of a junior high, and then you went from there to Horace Mann. But yeah, it was the, those two were the only place one could go as a black person in this community. Um, what are, do you have any particular memories about Dunbar uh, or the teachers there? I mean, uh, you know, it was community, it was family. There were teachers that were interesting there. Uh, Mr. King and his French, I remember. Um, and we had a regular routine. I did not like moving on to uh, Horseman because it was outdoors. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, supposedly to be a kind of uh, cutting edge high school at the time, but actually in the winter re it was freezing and when it rained, it rained on you because you were going from place to place outside the classroom when the halls were open. And it was later discovered that the person, I guess, who built this took it from some Floridian or something like that, you know, some place where it was really warm. So it was difficult with that, but you know, we got along and I remember, uh, you know, being there and being content, but also being not contented because every year we'd get this stuff supposedly shipped in from Central High and other white high schools and there would be, you know, three-legged tables and typewriters with keys missing and schmeary books and we were supposed to be grateful for this stuff. And I remember thinking, well, you know, who gets the new stuff? I mean, like, hello, you know, why don't we get the new things? What do they look like when they're new? And I knew that my mother had new books. So I knew, I knew what stuff looked like, you know. So there was in my life from the time I could realize who I was as a person, a discontent about the treatment I perceived and about the lifestyle that we led as second class citizens in the community. And when I was very young, I was writing letters to God saying, hello, okay, so you say we're all equal. Let these people take over for six months and give us the other six. Let's just see quality work out for me, you know. And I was very much a precocious child and a child who um, read a lot, read way ahead. I had whooping cough or what we would call now, I guess, asthma. And so um, 
I stayed uh, at home by myself a lot with my grandmother, who read to me a lot, taught me how to do math, advanced math. Um, and I kept being skipped in school. So I was a very uh, precocious child. Uh, tell me a little bit about what Little Rock was like in terms of segregation when you were growing up. I mean, how segregated was it? Did you see white people? The, the Little Rock was filled with segregation. First of all, uh, my life was oppressed in every way, basic way. When you went to Kerr Grocery, which was around the corner from where we lived, immediately the separation began. If you were waiting in line and somebody white was behind you, you, you he pushed you out. You know, let, let's wait on that person. Or if somebody came up to the meat counter, I could be standing at the meat counter, you know, my grandmother, I'd be holding her hand for 10 years until mm -hmm. he waited on everybody who was white. And he was thought among the black communities to be a kind man because occasionally he let people run bills. But in hindsight, as I looked back, he was really ripping people off because, yes, he let you run your bill for groceries, but he was always charging off stuff to the black people, rotten meat, or day old this, older milk. Uh, oh, let me go back here, Miss Indy. I have a special thing for you. You don't want to take it right there. And so um, it, was, it, was, it was in its most base segregated. Mm -hmm. If we went downtown, um, that was a terrific experience because if you were walking down the sidewalk and someone white walked towards you, you needed to get off the sidewalk in the sloshing rain. And, and I was really attached to this. I was really steaming because my grandmother and my mother were very precise about how one displayed one's love of the Lord. And that's through cleanliness and shining your shoes. And so I always had to wear saddle shoes. And so that meant, you know, every night you got to polish the white part and then the brown part, but then don't get the brown liquid on the white. So for me, to tell me to step off the sidewalk was like, OK, this means I have to go home. I had to first wash them down, let them dry. Then I have to polish them again. So as a child, I remember thinking, why do you get to walk on the sidewalk? Um, a lot of people have said that they were somewhat um, surprised and the city was taken by surprise in, in 57 when all the trouble broke out because Little Rock was a progressive city. I was just wondering well, what your thoughts I were I don't on know that. why people would say it was progressive. These are benevolent white people who thought they were being kind to quote the Negroes, unquote. I remember being in Bethel Amy Church and they hung people in the rafters. Is that kind? We rode in the back of a bus. I could sit in the balcony only of a movie. Um, there was no restaurants, no place to eat. Uh, the separation was evident. I mean, I'm a shopper. I believe I shop, therefore I am. And so I couldn't touch any of the merchandise. When you go downtown, I would want to touch things. I mean, what's liberal about it? I think what people thought was that as Christian human beings in this southern town where tradition was a part of how you grew up, how could then that group of people who had been raised in a certain way to love the Lord and respect life and family turn into these vicious rope carrying, we're going to hang you, shoot you, let's shoot through your house kind of people. I think that was the issue. Certainly no one expected the response to be violent. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you remember when Brown v. Board was handed down? Was that a particular, you know? Well, this, this is when grandmother and mother were making me read the paper. And so I was sort of reading along, you know, and it was, I remember the paper was like a nickel, I think, something like that. And um, so they were teaching me to be responsive and responsible to what was going on. And so I remember reading about its possibility and the fact that the NAACP was involved. And um, I, I, you know, I sneaked and I, I didn't always want to keep up. I didn't want to spend my allowance. And, I, and, I, and you couldn't find the paper and sometimes it was deliberate and sometimes not. But the day that Brown came down, I cannot ever forget because I, I was walking home from would be then Dunbar. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was this empty block where there had been persimmons in there. And um, 
I was really a daydreamer also as a child. I sang, I wanted to sing like Doris Day, okay, sirrah, sirrah, like, uh, you know, Johnny Mathis. I mean, I was really in love with music. And I, would, I was also somewhat of a loner, and I would walk across this field singing every day. That was my thing. That was my, and sometimes there'd be people with me and sometimes not. On this particular day, the teacher had let us out early, and the teacher seemed quite stressed. Go home straight. Go, you know, don't don't stop anywhere. Hold hands. Go together. And um, I remember thinking, why? And she sort of mentioned this Supreme Court decision. But as I'm crossing this field, uh, Persimmon Field alone, this guy approaches me, and he has on a Pendleton shirt. Come on with me, he says. Something like, I'll give you candy. Come this way. Come this way. I've, I've got good things, you know. And um, grandmother had told me that anybody who offers you candy, a grown man, a white man to boot, um, this is not working for me. So immediately I was frightened and I started uh, trying to go the opposite direction. Uh, no, uh-huh, do you hear me? Do you hear me talking to you? I'm walking, uh-huh, uh-huh. And the guy, of course, catches up with me. I trip and he has me on the ground. He's on top of me and, uh, you know, pulling at my underwear and hitting me and slapping me. And along comes this young woman who I, I will call Mary or something else at the moment because she probably still lives in Little Rock. And she um, would be what we call today retarded or delayed in her development, but she was quite big and she was in school with me. And uh, she used to always take my lunch, my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and and threaten us and everything because she was bigger. She could, you know. And on this particular day, she happened to cross this field, I guess, at the same time, intersected. And um, I had, I was carried a book bag. And so as this guy is on top of me, I guess she took the book bag and she was hitting with it and she's telling me like to run, get up, run, run, you know. And I want, I knew I shouldn't go home without the book bag because it cost a lot of money and we were poor. So I was trying to get the book bag with the books in it and she was saying, you know, get out, run, run, run. And so she saved me and uh, she chased me home up into the back door where my grandmother met me. And my, she told my, she, she whispered to my grandmother what was going on because I didn't 100% understand it because at that age they didn't have long conversations about sexuality or what was rape. Um, and so my grandmother took all my clothes to the backyard, she burned them, and she stuck me in a hot bathtub, made me sit there for a while. And, um, you know, that she made me pray. And my father came home, and my father and mother were discussing whether or not they should call the police. Mm -hmm. And my father said no, that the police would do to me what the man had not been successful in doing. Mm -hmm. So they didn't call the police. And um, I knew it was really big because we were very poor. My grandmother made clothes out of soaked flower bags, you know, that she soaked the fabric because flour came in fabric. So for her to burn my clothes, that was big. That was really big. And um, she said that from that day on, I would pray for that man or I would you know, 30 days in there of sort of prayer, because for my family, prayer was like a big thing. So we would pray and, you know, we would, would, would think about the goodness of God. And she talked about my purity after that and that purity is not taken away because of course in those days, one didn't think about kissing until, what, 18? I mean, my mother said, if you go on dates at 16, we, you'll be accompanied by me and grandma. So there was no thought of any, you know, Nothing that happens today is, has any relevance to the way I grew up. Were um, any members of your family or you a member of the NAACP in the mid-50s? We knew it existed, and my mother would tamper every now and then, but we, we weren't hard cell members. My mother, at the time, as I said, was involved in the integration of UALR. It was a funny story about how how they integrated was they brought in black people, but they had this circled fence around them. And 
the, the, I guess the black people sat within the fence. So I just have to say, stop, halt. Spirit, look to your left on the floor. There's this huge bug that's going all over the place. What is it? A cricket. Oh my God. It came over here, it went over there, it went over there. I'm hysterical. Grandma's not hysterical. Mom is a country girl. She's outdoors. She's not hysterical. Okay, all right. Sorry. No, that's okay. Because you're going to be patching anyway. You're going to be taping. When did you, or when were you first asked about the uh, possibility of going to Central? Do you remember sort of when yeah, that I was? Yeah, it was at Dunbar Junior High. It was in junior high school. It said, who lives in the neighborhood? Moi. I raised my hand. And who wants to go? Well, I did because my mother was getting her degree again at UALR and every single Sunday we went to Double Deck for ice cream and we drove down this road that I just drove here on today. I recognized the houses and we would take a ride. That was like our sunny treat to take a ride around this Central High School with all of its shaped topiary and beautiful you know, spray water thing going on and around the university and mother would say one day we would be going to that university because she really, as I look back, was quite focused in what she wanted from us. Reading us new words from the dictionary over dinner, telling us we were going to college, we're going to be college graduates. So she was a lady with a plan. And um, so I definitely, you know, remember that. Was um, um, one of the uh, stories surrounding all of this is that the Little Rock Nine were, you know, handpicked and vetted for grades and stable families and all this, that, and the other. I mean, do you have any recollection of that happening, or was it a voluntary? Well, see, one must realize that originally I think there were at least 116 people or something like that that were originally set to go. And as time passed and the school board did not want that many people, there was a narrowing down. Mm -hmm. And we were certainly asked, did we make good grades? And we all did make good grades. Uh, I think for certain there was a desire to have people who had no record of misbehavior, meaning if you were a fighter, then that wouldn't do. So I remember being that being discussed, you know, what is your school record? So certainly our school records were looked at. And um, I don't think hand-picked. Um, I didn't even know the connection between my going to Central High School and the NLACP for a long time. I mean, I don't think by any means hand-picked. I think we were hand-picked by fate. Mm -hmm. Because some historian has said that out of the nine of us, five of us are distantly related, so. Oh, really? Yeah, and um, for most of us, we'd spent a lifetime together. I mean, Terry Roberts was in school the first day I went to the first grade. Uh, Ernie Green I went to church with and we threw quarters back and forth in Sunday school class from the time uh, his aunts, Triopia, and mm -hmm. those people taught me, Mrs. Gravely taught me in school. So, you know, we all knew each other. Mm -hmm. Claudia Lanier was in Sunday school with us sometimes and uh, Minnie Jean lived up the block from me and we were best friends for, you know, most of our growing up. So we. We all know each other. When did um, Daisy Bates sort of come into the picture in terms of being um, responsible, I guess, for you is the only word that I can come up with, although I'm not sure it's the right word, and, and that, well, that she was seen as responsible for you. So how and when did that happen? That didn't, you know, I, first of all, I don't think she was responsible for us. You know, we have to look at our parents responsible for us. She was a local NAACP mm -hmm. uh, official. We kind of knew that. But really, we looked at Wally Branton and uh, Thurgood Marshall mm -hmm. and those people as being responsible for what was going on and more responsible, particularly Thurgood Marshall, who would come in so big, so tall, so straight, so sure of himself. Uh, as being responsible for our safety, uh, Mrs. Bates then uh, set up a, a situation in which she would call meetings at her house about what was going to take place. And ultimately, uh, as the media filtrated in, she was certainly more, uh, I would say, uh, 
you know, understood more the relationship between what we were doing and the media, whereas our parents neither knew nor cared. My mother understood it, but it wasn't her thing. She was teaching, she was mothering. And so slowly the, the role arose that Mrs. Bates, uh, she never went inside the school. She never stepped a step inside the school. She did not orchestrate the way in which we would go back and forth or any of that, but she would emerge uh, because of having these meetings at her house and making the connections with the media. Do you remember um, meeting with anyone from the school district before you started Central? Was there any attempt to Blossom. explain? There were many meetings with the school district and I remember Blossom being there and other people. I remember them being nasty at times, um, telling us don't drink out of the water fountains. Because remember at that time they were colored and and uh, if we wanted to antagonize, drink out of the water fountain, but try not to drink. I mean, yeah, I, I remember meetings with them, and I remember them not being, it wasn't like they were wel welcoming what was going on. We're going to do this with begrudging snidness. And I remember the one time my mother stood to ask a question, and they told her to shut up, you know, and were very nasty to her. They were, putting her down, you know, as though she had no right to ask this question when in fact it was her child that was going. Mm -hmm. And so they acted like they were cock of the walk, they were whatever, king and queen of whatever was going on. So I felt the hostility from, on their part from the beginning. You know? mm -hmm. I thought, well, these are not very, these are not the school board people welcoming us. These are the school board people saying, okay, got to do this. So. Do you have um, any distinct memories about uh, trying to go to school on September 4th when Falbus had called out the National Guard? Sure. I mean, by then, my life was saturated in Central High School. I had no freedom, no. That's the day on which there was confusion in the mix-up because Elizabeth Eckford didn't have a telephone. And my mother and I ended up coming later and walk, being separate from the group and being on the opposite side. And that, I remember everything about that day. That's the day, you know, we almost got hanged. Do you, did you hear Falbus' speech the night before oh, yeah. on television? Absolutely. So what was your take on him calling out the National Guard? Well, we thought he was calling out the National Guard to keep peace, to not necessarily protect us, but certainly to abate any violence. We thought the National Guard was being called out by the governor as a, a way to assuage the incredible rioting and gathering and marching and threaten, threatening that was going on. Because by this time, people were calling my house. People were coming to my house. Uh, people were threatening my father, who worked on a job. People were threatening my mother. So I mean, by this time, our life was messy. I mean, it was frightening. and. Um, we thought that, okay, here goes the National Guard. Certainly this governor is an official of this state, and he's taking over. He's going to clarify the situation. But it was not to be, because surprisingly enough, the people that we expected to be there to clarify, in fact, turned out to be the people that linked themselves together and kept Elizabeth from entering and set up a situation in which we were the bait for this predatory mob. So absolutely then the goal that we thought was there was not there. Mm -hmm. And so for the you know next three weeks you could not go to school while the legal wrangling um, went on but what was it like to try to go back on the 23rd? Well you know we had sat through court and we watched mm -hmm. the judge and we watched the process and uh, Ms. Bates and our parents and other people, uh, of course, um, in the interim, I think at some point Dr. King had come down and we were now entities. We were the Little Rock Nine. We were written about, photographed. Our lives were constricted. And, um, I thought a lot about what it meant to go back. We hoped that the ruling by the court would mean that now the governor had to obey the law and grown-ups had to behave as grown-ups. I mean, after all, 
think about the world in 1957. I lived in a very patterned world where grown-ups did certain things and grown-ups who went to church did certain things and they respected themselves and they didn't behave in this way. So we expected them to behave the way grown-ups are supposed to behave. But going back and knowing that just the police were there, did it frighten you? Or did you think everything was going to be okay on, on that day? Excuse me, I thought the law is the law. Mm -hmm. This judge has made his ruling. The governor's heard it. The, the, the rioting people can go home now. They've heard this. This is all going to work out. This is all going to be okay. We're going to go to school, and they won't like us in the beginning because we're new. But then we wouldn't be liked at any new school. Because as a 15-year-old mm -hmm. child and a 16-year-old child, there's nowhere in your mind that you perceive the magnitude of what these people were thinking. There's nowhere in your mind as a child that you perceive that you can be the brunt of somebody's horrifying abuse. There's nowhere in your mind. There was nothing in my mind. There's no computer card that said, Melba, you can be killed. Not at first. It took a long time for me to realize how much danger I faced. So now we have to cut for a moment while we move the fan so maybe it should oscillate because now it's a bit much. It's gonna make me cough, see if I ask that. So can we just turn it down a bit? Yeah, turn it down and maybe make it move. Yeah, can you put it on low? How's that? Yeah, that's better. Well, how about this? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, because otherwise I'll start wheezing, coughing, you know. It's drying me out. Nobody will be happy. Hi. Yeah. We're good to go, I think, here. Okay. So the 23rd didn't exactly turn out how you thought it would. No. The 23rd of September turned out to be a disaster. It's called Mob Monday. And it's, it's, it turned out to be one of the most frightening days of my life. It was, that was the day that I figured out, now wait a minute, these people are too serious. Mm -hmm. They are so serious, um, they're going to kill me. They're going, they really do, you know, in order for me not to go to this school, these people are willing to do me in. Mm -hmm. So, do you remember hearing President Eisenhower announce his intentions to send the 101st? Or had you all been notified well, in no, advance? Well, no, by then we we, we we'd been notified. Mm -hmm. um, remember there's the, the, the mob Monday when we had to be taken out of school. And, you know, we, we, we heard them discussing how they were going to get us out. Maybe in order to block that mob, they're going to have to let one hang so as to distract and then um, we were rescued by that wonderful gentleman whose name I wish I remembered. Police drove my car and I did get to hug him later and say thank you. Um, when I got out of the car, I just thank you for the ride. I said thank you for the ride, you know, because you're 15, you're 16, what do you know, you know. But um, so, so that, was, that was like, okay, this is really big. It's like bringing home a kitty cat and then waking up the next morning and there is a lion in your backyard. This is really bigger. The word integration is, what does this mean? What does this word mean? I remember getting out the dictionary and looking this word up, right? Because this is really a big word. This is not a word I understand anymore. This, is, this going to Central High School is big. Mm -hmm. This is big. And we were frightened. People were shooting in our house. I mean, uh, people were getting bombs. Some of the nine were getting bombs in their houses. And uh, we couldn't go to the store. We couldn't go out. We couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go to the community center to play cards, for heaven's sake, or listen to music. I couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the announcement, of course I remember the announcement, because by this time there were rampaging mobs running rampant mm -hmm. throughout Little Rock, coming into the black neighborhood, shooting at people, uh, tossing their ropes around. So yes, ma'am, I remember that. I remember sitting and watching pictures of those Jeeps coming across the bridge, just the headlights just the, the glow of the headlights and thinking, all right. And my grandmother, I remember her saying, singing, you know, she would always sing when she was happy. Because we thought, yeah, you know, this is America. 
and ultimately there was a law. Because, you know, no one really understands, I think, unless you're there, how it feels when there is a deficit in the law because you expect to be protected unless you are black and have lived in those communities where no the fire department's not coming because you're black they might come but they're going to be late don't call the police if you're raped because they're going to come and do you again or do somebody your mother maybe don't so if you live in this community but there are a few laws that you count on and then those laws don't exist anymore we were totally frightened out of our wits my uncles were calling from out of town. My, uh, you know, it was, it was a big thing for him to send those troops because we thought, okay, here go these guys. And uh, the night before that announcement came, it was way late at night, and my grandmother used to sit up with a gun called Mr. Higginbottom. My grandmother was a sharpshooter. And uh, daddy, granddaddy taught her to shoot very sharp because you're never supposed to kill anybody then you'll go to hell for sure. So you gotta shoot good enough so you hit an arm or a leg, never the center of the body. So she was sitting up that night and these guys, they knock on the door. And uh, they present me, you know, they say who they are and my grandma said, show me your, and she's holding a, a, a rifle. And she says, show me your identification. And you know, they had a dark suit, the, what you'd expect, I guess, FBI or whatever to be wearing. And they said, uh, send your child to school tomorrow. The president will protect your child. And they hand us in a letter, which I still have today, from President Eisenhower saying that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a very brief letter, says the White House, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so, so then we waited and these troops came in and we knew their purpose. And um, we thought, okay, so they'll take us to school a few days. The white people will see that we're harmless. We're nine people among 1,900 after all. What could we possibly do? They'll see that we're harmless. I mean, me with my ponytail and my saddle shoes and Minnie with her singing and Jefferson with his running and Ernie with his great political jokes and, and Gloria with her suave, you know, intellectuality. and. Carlotta with her girl next door wildness and beauty and, and you know, all of Thelma with her very subtlety and her, her heart. Who are we? How harmful are we? And, and Terry always humming, you know? I mean, we were just kids. And, and, and none of us great fighting athletes. So, I mean, what are we going to do, right, you know? And by then, we were a tightly knit group because understand the dynamics here. As this progressed, we are now outsiders in the black community just as we are somewhat outsiders in the white community because we are going into territory yet unexplored and by doing so, we are causing white merchants to put pressure on blacks in our community. They then in turn call us and so we are stepping out on a limb, huge limb. But we went back to school with the aid of the, of the, of the 101st. I remember uh, seeing these soldiers in my front yard that night and thinking, huh, you know, maybe I'm going to sleep. Because prior to that night, I hadn't slept. My, not very much at all. My grandma and my mother always said to me, somebody comes, go out the back door and down to 9th Street. Now, 9th Street was like the honky tonk row, just where these few little black nightclubs were and whatnot. Some place they would tell us to never go for any reason. But they instructed us, somebody comes in the front, we're gonna keep them, you go out the back and go down to 9th Street where you'll be safe. Go to the neighbor, you know, in other words, they, we, we had instructions, my, my little brother and I, for what to do. And so now we're living in the expectation of hell. You know, we're living in an inflamed world where as children, are, are, we're gonna be killed. And so, uh, these are new prospects for me. me, you know, new thoughts. I had nightmares, I couldn't eat for a while, and we decided to go back to school. And people will say, why? Well, what choice did we have? Was Little Rock gonna change? We thought that if we went to Central High School, I thought, this is my naive teenage thought, if I go to Central High School 
it's going to be like Cincinnati, Ohio. It's going to be wonderful because the year before I went, the summer before I went, I had experienced Cincinnati, Ohio. Freedom. And I wanted to stay there. It was in Cincinnati, Ohio that I learned that I was going to go to Central High School. Because although I had signed up to go, I never told my parents. I signed my mother's name. She never knew. Nobody ever knew. Anything. So we went back because my grandmother said to me, if God has assigned you a task in this life and you don't do it, now, next time around, you don't do it. So there was no turning back for me. There was just your moving ahead. And so on that day that we were to go, we met at Mrs. Bates' house. And all of these soldiers were there with these Jeeps. And they had these beautiful, crisp khaki uniforms on it. I remember walking up in front of some of them and going like this, trying to see if they blink, because they had their weapons at their sides. And they were looking straight out. And they were so pretty. They were just beautiful. And they made us feel so safe. And you know, we thought, wow, this is just, you know, there were just so many news people there. There were news people in the trees. There were news people all over the place. And uh, there were these three black men. I'm trying to remember, Philadelphia and Washington, Chicago Defender, who we had made friends with. And they ultimately that day would be injured on pretty seriously. But everybody was there that morning. It was huge. And I remember this minister praying aloud for us. And I thought, well, you know, God is here. The troops are here. It's going to be fine. And we, you know, and we were children. Please, you know, when I was writing about this in my book, I looked back and I thought we were children, for heaven's sakes. We were worried not about what's going to happen when you get to school. We were worried about who gets to sit where in the station wagon. We wanted to, first of all, ride in the Jeep. Could somebody please ride in the open Jeeps? No, they said. You have to sell the... Who sits in the front, right? We're worried about if we wrinkle our clothes, if we sit too close together and, you know, didn't dawn on me, although we, I had some thoughts, that if the President of the United States has to send the 101st Airborne, who are soldiers and heroes from war to protect your black butt, you're in a lot of trouble, right? <laughs> I mean, this should be one's first thought, but it was not our first thought. We thought, how cute the soldiers are. Are there any black soldiers? No, they kept them away. But after all, we were 15, 16, 17, and so we, were, we girls were looking for prospective dates, and we were thinking, where, where are the minorities? Where are the blacks? No, they kept them separate. Yeah. So, you know, we just tootled on into the car, and there we go. And only when we get sort of in this white neighborhood, kind of near Central, do we hear these people screaming, boo! You know, and just horrifying kinds of epithets at us, you know. Because here came the question of states' rights and all of the things that the South had labored to preserve. And we were stepping over that line. Because by sending the troops, Eisenhower had made them an offer they couldn't refuse. And so it was a messy entryway. But nevertheless, we didn't get that. That is a comment as an adult in hindsight, as children in that car. Ernie was telling the jokes. We all have roles, interestingly enough, all nine of us. And we all, to this day, are the same people in relationship to each other that we were then. Ernie is the absolute boss. We do not defy him. If he makes a decision or says something, it's done, as he wishes. And he always was, in some ways, a, a fatherly protector in that he told jokes and said, you know, come on. He'd say things like, do you all see the welcome wagon? There's no welcome wagon here. So welcome wagon here, Mel. You're expecting a welcome? I mean, all the way to school, he and, he and Terry would have this like dialogue going on every single day, which was a nervous, I think, way of responding to what was just cold, stark fear. There was this new feeling in my stomach that came in that didn't go away for the nine months. An unexplainable, like, this is big. This is bigger than anything you've ever faced. This is not going away. This is going to hurt every single day. 
But Ernie, you know, to this day, I just saw him in the hall before I came here, right? And to this day, he is cool and in charge. And that's lovely. I mean, I love him for that because somehow each of us make up the slices of this pie. Each of us plays a role. And it all works. It all fits together. And it fit together in this most incredible period. So we rode in those Jeeps telling our jokes. And uh, we went to school. So uh, a lot has been made about you know, what, what went on inside of the school. And, and your book certainly, I think, um, opened that up for a lot of people and gave them some understanding on that. And we're certainly aware that there were some sort of dedicated, hardcore segregationist students that made it extremely difficult for you all. But I want to ask about all the other white students. I think that, that, that people forget that there were all of us caught up in this inexorable situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were white students in there who came at us with knives, acid in my eyes. My publisher stripped out 40% of the horror because he said nobody could survive, stand to read it. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely, though, there were students who offered to carry a book. There were students who, on that first day, would say, come and sit with me. There were students who smiled, excuse me, who um, were human in the beginning. But what we could see as time moved on is that those students were castigated for their humanity. Uh, out of the 1900, you know, what, 20%? in the beginning were engaging, but then they enrolled others to engage. And I don't think there was ever a time when every single student was participating in that. It became a core of people who were rumored to be trained by the, the White Citizens Council and the Mothers Club, mm -hmm. actually called into classes and trained. Is that true? I have no idea. But certainly there was discussion about that in class. Some of the students around us talked about it. I learned how to do your blog kick your heel, I'm going to get you in this chins, you know, wait till, you know, wait till this class is over. What? And so certainly, you know, there were students who in the beginning were very much ordinary people, frightened to death, caught up in the same trap that we were, trying to extend a hand, frightened to extend a hand, and then their fears realized as several of them were beat up on the way home. And I've talked to some of those people afterwards. And they were in as much hot water as we were. Mm -hmm. Because if they showed any grace to us, they were then questioned and reprimanded. And certainly there were teachers, you know. I remember my English teacher, Mrs. Hucklesby, and my shorthand teacher, whose name escapes me at this moment. I said I'd never for forget Mrs. Pickwick, I think is her name. Anyway, she was the dearest woman that ever lived because it was only in her class every day that I felt safe. She was very tiny. But anybody who walked near me, she'd say, no, 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 no. You move over here. And that was from the first day I was ever there. From that first Monday, I went inside the school and had to be pulled out. This woman was a tower of strength. And certainly, you know, the vice principal who would say to us all the time, she was not necessarily for integration. But what she was was for humanity. She didn't want us murdered on her watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she took care of business, sometimes pulled us into her office on days that she thought were really bad near the end when there were no soldiers there. So the illusion, and I always try to make it clear as I speak across the United States, and I think I say so in my book, don't, don't, don't have the illusion that I'm alive solely because of black people and minorities. First of all, priests and rabbis marched with us. Quakers came down from the north, uh, Spar Hall, and this whole big Quaker organization came down to teach us how to stop, drop, and roll. We were taught how to be nonviolent. As my grandmother's reading to me about Gandhi, these people are preaching to me in the other ear about nonviolence and love. Uh, many, 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 many people, Benjamin Fine and the people who rescued Elizabeth, um, everybody who was white was not a villain. Otherwise, I'd be very, 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 very dead. 
and um, some of the people, you know, I, I hypothesize still that had Governor Faubus had the proper attitude, an appropriate attitude, had he not wanted to back segregationists because he wanted an elect re-election, some of this may never have happened. I'm not saying we would have been welcomed by what Ernie calls the welcome wagon, but I'm saying I don't think that it would have gotten out of control. It got totally out of control. And, you know, effigies on trees and me, ha me standing in front of a tree waiting to be hanged. And, you know, this, this is, gets ugly. Mm -hmm. And had a different environment top down been established, mm -hmm. we are going to follow the law. This is the law of the land. Then we might not be here today. We probably have no need to be here today. Um, after the 57-58 school year, um, during um, that, the following summer, um, did, you, did you go to New York as some of the... We went on a tour, huge, huge tour. You know, now we were stars. We were, you know, unwilling in some ways stars because, don't forget, being a star traps you. You can't go out with your friends still. You can't do ordinary things. I remember being in this place called Intercourse, New York. And this woman came into our hotel room with cameras and she followed us all day long. I remember being followed, people watching what food I ate, uh, going in the White House, taking tours, going all over New York City. I mean, truly, you know, it was um, uh, an incredibly difficult role for a child of that age to be in. And, um, we had to then count only on ourselves as friends because we are all we had. We spent a lot of time together. People wonder why at, at 60 and 63 and 64, are we all so close. We still call each other. You know, I, I don't miss a week without calling, talking to Carlotta. Um, we, we all write each other, we email each other because we didn't have anybody else. Mm -hmm. And so we are like brothers and sisters. So that summer we went on tour all over the place. And uh, part of that was fun. We got to meet Johnny Mathis and all these <laughs> big, huge stars, you know, uh, dressing up breathlessly, waiting, anticipating. And so that part was great. You know, it was, was sort of like a gift after the horrifying experience we'd had. Because that experience, don't forget, would put its mark on all of our lives all of the lives of our family. You know, would my mother have been in a coma 10 years after her strokes? I don't know, I don't think so. Would my grandmother have died when she died at such a young age? Had I not been at Central, I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. You know, would some of us be in different health than we are now? A lot of people died. Remember that, what is this, Little Rock chief or whatever of police or North Little Rock that went home and shot his wife and his kids. So a lot of people died and a lot of people suffered, and a lot of my relatives suffered, my, my, my brother. And um, still, that summer for us was a new stepping across the line, uh, looking in the White House, seeing all these worlds that we hoped would become a Little Rock world, and experiencing our newfound freedom mm -hmm. as, as black people in the North who are worshiped and adored. Uh, all the limousines, all the expense accounts, I remember being, Upstairs one day, I think in the Waldorf, with a really important hotel, and we all said, "Okay, well, <laughs> let's go for it. Let's see what we can order." You know, we would do that wherever we went. We had a ball. And then at the end of the summer, you don't get to go back to to Central. So, yeah, now we come home as stars, but in fact, we are not welcomed by the black community or the white community because we've now set up a situation in which all the schools are closed. And I remember getting calls from black kids on the day that school was supposed to open saying, you know, do something. We, we, we hate you for this. We, we don't have a school anymore. We are not sure we'll ever get a school back. So everything hit a hard rock kind of thing. And our neighbors were angry at us. People had lost their jobs and my father had been threatened with guns on his job and my mother's teaching job had been taken away. She only got it back because her bishop knew, knew white people who had power. And uh, she threatened to go to the press. And so a lot happened in that summer. But when we got home, it was the party's over. 
and now, first of all, forget the party. All summer long, the thought haunted me of, can I go back? Because on that last day, I had burned my books, which I would never, ever do because of my respect for books. My mother's master's is in library science. And all of my life with my grandmother, I have been taught the preciousness of books. And I tell you that on that last day, I remember standing in front of that trash can and crying. And my grandmother not wanting me to burn those books. And inside myself, I said, I am never, ever, I cannot live through that again. I can't make it. Because I felt like somebody had walked over my soul with cleats. Mm -hmm. I felt a wound inside of my selfness that I didn't think I'd ever repair. So when you found out the schools were going to be closed, what was your plan B? Well, I didn't have one. I had two things going on at that point. The grandmother that had, for the most part, raised me with my mother, because my parents had been divorced when I was younger, uh, was dying. She'd been diagnosed with leukemia. And she was my moon, my stars, my everything. And so she was dying. We just learned that she was dying. And she was in the house with us. And at the same time, I was at home. And so that was a very, very difficult time, because I was relegated to being at home. Um, all of us were at home. We couldn't go anywhere. I remember I used to walk around to Thelma's house or go to Minnie Jean's house. Uh, we all had stuff going on, mm -hmm. big stuff in our lives. And here we come off the road where we had every access to every luxury you could have had. And now we're home, we're nothing. We're not only not stars, but we're relegated to this space of a pariah, in the sense that look at the trouble you've caused in the black community. The MAACP at this time has got to do some legal stuff, so we've got to stand still. They don't want us to go to school other places. They ask us not to go to school other places because we are the plaintiffs in the case. So if we go enroll in other cases, in other schools, what effect would that have, you see? So it was a difficult time. That September was a difficult time. And when the uh, vote occurred and Falba shut down the four high schools, did you stay in Little Rock? Did you? Stayed in Little Rock. Stayed in my house with my grandmother. Uh, she died in October of that year. And then I was in that house by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, going through her things, standing in her room, I thought it was the end of my world. I thought, you know, this is what the end of life for me is like. Um, really stressed by this. Um, remember, I used to watch soap operas and pretend I was in them um, with family, because there, there was a woman on As the World Turns that kind of resembled my grandmother. And um, I used to then, to occupy myself, I started doing all the things that she did, ironing, cooking, cleaning. It was just absolutely almost unbearable. Because at the same time, we were also beginning to see these flyers, uh, which said that they would kill us rather than let us go back to that school anyway. 10,000 dead, 5,000 alive. Um, we were getting phone calls saying, you're never going back. You know, you're never going to graduate from that school. Ernie did, but you're, you know, that's it. He's the only one out of there. And uh, there was certainly every bit of evidence around that you know, wh what are we going to do? I had no plans. You ask, well, my plans? I had no plans. This NAACP said hang. And some of the families did, and some of the families didn't. My mother elected to, I stayed out of school that year. My, I had, as every black family in the world has, relatives who are white, who are passing. Mm -hmm. Some relatives who are really white, but other relatives who are passing for white. So I had this relative at the time who was white passing, who, and, and he called up. He was a, a sheriff, and he called up and told my mother that he was also in the Klan and had a white wife and five white kids. And this is a common story. And, and, you know, and he would come home on holidays and visit, and so he called up. And he told my mother that you have to get her out of there because they really are quite serious about not having you go back now. And so that's when the NAACP perceived that we were in some danger as well. Mm -hmm. 
and it would be during the latter part of that year that they began searching for homes with us, for us rather, and telling us that we would be leaving probably. Some people were already gone. I think Terry was gone and maybe Gloria was gone. Some, some of us were already gone. I don't remember exactly which ones, but, and so some of us were left. Minnie Jean, Thelma, me, several of us were still there and we called each other and tried to meet at the community center. But once again, we weren't accepted. I didn't feel accepted. The others might have felt accepted. We got asked strange questions. You're not going back to that school, are you? What are you doing? And also, because we've been seen in so many pictures in the newspaper and whatnot, we were just set apart from them. Mm -hmm. Our lives set us apart. What are your feelings about Orville Falbus? That he gave me a gift. He was a man who didn't know any better. My grandma would say, if he knew better, he'd do better. God always makes people uh, the way they're supposed to be made. And he's God's person, you know, he's a very precious man. He's God's precious child. And he was doing what he thought was right at the time. And he, he in a sense, didn't he? He did us all a favor. Because had he not made such a stink, and had he not caused Eisenhower to send the troops, then the rest of the South and segregation wouldn't have fallen like dominoes. It would have been a longer and harder struggle had he shut up. If he just shut up, it would have been a much longer struggle. But once those troops were sent in, it is my theory that governors had to look at that. And they had to say, now, wait a minute. I don't want those federal troops on my territory. Let me just re-examine this order to integrate. I'm going to do as little as possible, but I'm certainly not going to defy the federal government because if I, federal, if I defy the federal government, the consequence is major. And so I love Mr. Faubus. He did us a favor, didn't he? When you look at it now, I can say that as an adult. As a child at some point, somebody in the NAACP argument was challenged him to take an IQ test against me. Because I was always floated around somebody have a very high, somebody said, you know, have her take an exam and show, you know, who's IQ. Because he always talk about IQs. And ultimately, I was thrilled to find out that he ended his life working in some bank somewhere with a black supervisor. So you see, God is good. It always comes out in the wash, doesn't yeah. it? Um, uh, ultimately, and, and from your vantage point now, what do you think the crisis was about? Is it race? Is it class? Is it Well, I think it was, um, you know, no, that crisis was about Governor Faubus and his need to be reelected. And it was about that need. It was all of these things that came to a juncture at once. If one looks at it intellectually, just to praise it intellectually, it is about the serendipitous set of circumstances that comes together. A governor wants to be reelected. He doesn't want to displease those people whom he perceives to be capable of reelecting him. Uh, there was a constituency that believes they don't want things changed in the South, and the Papa governor is going to give them an open road to do what they want to do. And there are a group of people in the NAACP that say, hello, it's time to quit asking and start demanding. And all this stuff had to come into play. And when you look at it, and I examined it because I wrote the book, when you look at it, and I'm looking at it again as I'm writing another book, and if you truly look at it, you see that it's one of those God things. It's a fate thing, because I felt as though we were on this train careening down this track, and nothing in the world could have stopped any of the people involved, whether it be the segregationists who took the ropes, whether it be Fawbos or anybody. It was just these circumstances coming together, which compelled everybody to act in the way that they needed to act, and it, it made for huge changes. Because had it been any other way, I still contend, had, he, had Fawbos been silent, this would have been a silent thing. No troops would have come. It'd have been cool. We wouldn't have, the, the domino effect would not have been set in. And it was the overview of news reporters that altered the context of the situation. It was the fact that this was a worldwide event, one of 10 top news items of the year. And it had such a compelling impact. Later on, as I grew up, I would become a newscaster, a journalist get degrees in it because of watching how their observance of what was going on kept me alive, altered the circumstance, and also altered the political flow of everything, right? Eisenhower can't not send the troops, for heaven's sakes. You're killing children. 
right? And so thing after thing happened that was a serendipitous act of fate almost. I mean, I don't think any one person had such a powerful thing going on. I think it's all this stuff. It's about timing. Timing's everything. Yeah. The NAACP was prepared to move forward. The people who wanted segregation were prepared to move forward. Everybody was prepared to move forward. It was full tilt, boogie ahead on all the tracks. And when those tracks intersected, mm -hmm. you got this huge play of power between the state and the union. Um, one last question. You've um, come to Little Rock on this trip for um, two great occasions tomorrow, a dedication of a statue honoring um, all of you, and then the first day cancellation of a, a stamp about the civil rights movement, including um, the nine. Um, sort of what are your thoughts on coming back to Little Rock with the, under these conditions? Well, you know, for me, it's, it's a wonderful time, first off, always to see my family, and the Little Rock Nine are my family. Uh, we don't know how many times we'll be together again. So when we're in one room together, which we will be this afternoon, it's the most incredible, magical time. Because truthfully, when it is all said and done, the only people who really knew what happened and how painful it was is us. Mm -hmm. The only people who can really talk about where we're at and what we're doing in our heads is us. And so it is a magical time, you know, with our pot bellies, our gray hair, our grandchildren, Terry brings along this beautiful, this beautiful grandson that looks just like him and, and you know, Minnie Jean will bring her, her grown children. And we all have children and grandchildren now. And um, so that's a part of it. For me, it's significant because I bring with me, when I left Central High School, under all of that pressure and fear, I was, ironically enough, adopted, taken in by a white family. See, fate always has a hand in everything. And so part of the healing of my awful wound was this couple, Dr. and Mrs. George McKay, who took me in. They had four of the children, and that mother and that father would always say to me, you are never less than my daughter. My dad would always say to me, as he took me to college the first day, as he took me to high school the first day. He was a professor who helped to found Sonoma State University. My mom, at the time, was a Quaker activist who marched for women's rights, who set up uh, you know, public television, who to this day, at age 87, is organizing everybody. And so she comes with me here today. At 87 years of age, pacemaker in hand, she flew down with me on the plane. So although my birth mother was in the hospital having been in a coma 10 years, my other mother, I call her, my mom, Kay McCabe, was with me. So what's wrong with this? What's not good about it? For me, it is a monumental occasion. We, I am grateful to all the people of Little Rock because this is something we all did together. We all grew from our adolescent stage to adults intellectually understanding why diversity is necessary. We all did this together. We all made this trip together. It's not me alone. There's no way I'd survive with all the people who stood up and said, this is not right, and we're going to make some changes. So it's a, it's a, it's a party. It's a celebration. Um, it's a coming of age for Little Rock because what a change. Can you put a statue on a lawn and by doing so mark a change of heart? I think you can. The stamp, of course, you know, at work, I'm a professor, and at work all my professorial buddies say to me, are you dead yet? Nobody <laughs> except dead people get stamps. But the stamp was a total surprise, and uh, it's, it's, it's a, you know, there's a soft spot in my heart for that. So what can I tell you? I mean, that there's not, it's all good. It's all good, and it just shows that what my grandmother said to me as a child is correct. She said, time brings about a change. You're never in charge. God's in charge. He sets the stage. He puts the actors on it, and then he directs. So hang in there and see how your pieces of your puzzle are going to fall, because it's not going to be anything that you expected. So did I think this day was coming? No. Did I think there'd be a statue? Thank God it's a thin statue, everybody. No, I didn't. It's a thinner statue of me. I said to them, don't make this statue fat. So no, I, it's a great day. My mom is sitting over there right now. She's with me. What can I ask for? I can't ask for any more. It's a big, huge blessing for everybody who's you know, not understanding what the word blessing means. Blessing is that really great day that comes that makes you smile a lot after everything didn't go right. Yeah. 
So that's what today is. It's a blessing. Good. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Screen fades to black, arrowhead of the National Park Service, Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site with accompanying social media logos and handles.